Mom, your voice is off. Uh, so, did it get muted right from the beginning or uh, did it happen just now? It was Should off from the beginning of this one. Oh, no. Okay, fine. I'll just uh, repeat those sentences. Um, uh, the first argument that Paul makes uh, is that do not go back to the law because a curse will come upon you. The second argument that he makes is regarding a promise which has only one party and the law which has two parties. So the second argument that he's presenting is that when God made his promise, he was willing to unilaterally on his own fulfill all the requirements which are you know, going to be required to make that promise happen. So no conditions are being attached on people in any way. So is it not better to go to that kind of a promise rather than go to a law which was conditional and involved two parties where both parties would have to do their side. Only then will the benefits come. Otherwise, the benefits will not be granted because when it comes to the Mosaic law, very clearly God says, if you do your part, then I will do my part. So here, Paul, the second argument that he's presenting is that, isn't it better to go to the promise which is being offered freely, where God is fulfilling all the requirements, where nothing is expected from our side? Isn't it better to go to that rather than go to a law which is highly conditional, where you would have to keep your part? So uh, that's the second argument that he makes. So this being the case, he says, why then was the law given at all? I mean, uh, if uh, the law is really that inferior and not able to give us salvation, then why, why first of all, introduce the law at all? You know, so he wants to explain that to them. Uh, so uh, if we can have someone read out for us, verses 19 to 22. Yeah, 19 to 22, please. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only but god is one is the law then against the promise of god certainly not for if there had been a law given which could have given life true righteousness would have been by the law but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in jesus christ might be given to those who believe amen Amen. So here uh, he says, uh, so why, why was the law given at all? Because, you know, it's not as though God changed his mind. Uh, in the beginning, God made a promise and he said that he would fulfill whatever requirements are going to be there, you know, to make that promise happen. And then later, 430 years later, did he change his mind and he decided, no, 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 I don't really want to keep my promise. Let me in introduce a new uh, uh, covenant, a different covenant, where uh, the human party also will have to do their side. So it got changed his mind after 430 years and then re uh, introduced something else. No, the two are linked. There is a link between the promise which was originally made and the law which came for 30 years later, there's a link between them. God made his promise to Abraham and God made his promise to Jesus Christ through whom all the people would you know, be redeemed. So God did that. But until that promise is fulfilled, this nation of Israel had to be kept under control because left to themselves, they would have become just like all the other nations. And uh, then the Messiah would not have been able to come through that you know, nation and through that lineage. Um, so therefore, uh, it's here, he, you know, Paul explains in verse 19, why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions 
until the seed to whom the promise referred had come so uh, so that to, to keep the nation in line to continuously make them aware of what god's standards are to urge them and encourage them to follow him because he has said he is going to grant them many blessings if they will follow him so by doing all of this the law was trying to keep them in line until the seed can come through that nation through that lineage so for the sake of keeping these people under control uh, the law was imposed as a temporary guardian uh, and so he explains that further um, if we were to look at um, verses 23 to uh, maybe 27 if someone could read out for us verses 23 to 27 please but before faith came <clears throat> we were kept under guard by the law kept for the faith which could afterwards be revealed therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to christ that we might be justified by faith but after faith has come we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of god through faith in jesus christ in christ jesus for as many as you are as many as you are you were baptized into christ have put on christ amen yes so here paul says there are basically two functions which the law performed for a temporary period it it served as a guard it you know it kept the people under lock and key uh, you know as in it bound them by a, by a bunch of rules which they had to follow so in that sense, it was like it was their guard. It it imprisoned them and forced them to stay within certain limits. Um, it also served as a tutor because it showed the people again and again that they are unable to keep the law. It showed them how helpless they are because they might have thought very nicely, you know, very well about themselves. And so the law showed them how utterly hopeless and helpless they are. And so the law was a tutor which, which proved to them again and again that on their own there is no hope for them. No way will they ever make it into heaven. No way can they ever have a relationship with God. No way can they ever be blessed. So the, the tutor, uh, law as a tutor imprinted these truths upon them. And so it prepared them in every way so that their hearts and minds will be ready when the seed finally comes to fulfill that promise which was originally made. So God always had the promise in mind. The idea was always to fulfill that promise. The idea was always to redeem mankind through the promise. The law was just something which was brought in temporarily to keep this nation in line so that you know God can use them as his instrument through which the seed will one day come. Uh, so the law only had a temporary job. And so Paul is saying, don't go to the law. The law served its purpose. It came for what it uh, was meant to do and it fulfilled its purpose. But the promise is what you need to look to because that is what uh, God always gave to us from the beginning. And that is what he wanted us to focus upon. Um, so with that um, you know, background that he has given, now he talks about some additional aspects of the law in chapter 4. Uh, so if we could have uh, somebody read out for us um, the first seven verses. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, please. Now I say, I say that the hair, as long as, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, 
when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. Yes. So in chapter 3, he explained to them how the law is something very temporary and very inferior. So it would not be wise to go back to it. And having explained that, you know, because they would have been wondering in their minds, why, why is the law not something that we are supposed to go back to? So he has explained to them very clearly why the law was just a temporary thing, not something that they should be pinning their hopes on. And now he's talking about the status which they have. Because under the law, their status was very low. But now, under the promise of Christ, their status has uh, risen. And it's something very, very high now. So this is what he explains. He says, um, you know, think about a child who is heir of a very large property. You know, so maybe he's the heir of a, of, of a very, uh, uh, of very rich parents. But that heir, even though he's the heir of something so great, of such a large and wealthy inheritance, as long as he is a child, he is just like um, you know a slave. The slave receives orders from the you know the master of the home. This child also has to live under the orders of the master of the home. There's not much difference between them. But then when the time comes for this uh, heir to you know grow up into adulthood and now uh, the property is turned over to him then the status of the two changes the slave continues being a slave but this uh, child is now um, the heir and all that inheritance now belongs to him so uh, paul is saying all of us were like the like that child once upon a time you know we had been placed under the uh, guardianship of the elemental spiritual forces is what he says in uh, chapter 4 verse 3 what are these elemental spiritual forces under which you know the israelites had been placed as slaves these are the uh, spiritual forces of uh, having to uh, perform certain sacrifices uh, certain rituals had to be uh, undertaken on a daily basis um, they had to uh, celebrate certain feasts uh, because those feasts are symbolizing certain spiritual truths they had to uh, dress in a particular way you know they they were they're allowed to only uh, manufacture cloth uh, of one particular type they're not supposed to mix the uh, the the fibers of two different types of uh, uh, material uh, so the, all these things all these things which are symbolizing and pointing towards the future of what god will do they were under the control of all these rituals and ceremonies because all these rituals and ceremonies were guarding them, um, keeping them in line, preparing them for the day when the Messiah would come through them. So um, they were uh, they were slaves under these forces. But he says, now something else has happened to you. Now you have been redeemed from this law and you have been adopted to sonship. So now you're no longer like the child who, you know, who has to follow and obey orders and be under the master, just like the slave. That is the condition that we all were in once upon a time. But now we have been brought into uh, adoption to uh, in, into sonship under God. So now we actually are uh, heirs of the inheritance. Once upon a time, we were just slaves, but now we actually have an inheritance our uh, status has become uh, that of you know people who have walked into their inheritance and can now claim it so uh, when that kind of a status has been given to you why do you want to go back and be like a, a child who is under the under the elemental spiritual forces so uh, 
if you were to go back to the law, in fact, you're going back to a lower status. You're going back to the status of a slave. Whereas now you are a, you have the status of a son. You are, you have the status of someone who has inherited. So therefore, he says in verses six and seven, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. So as long as uh, you know the Israelites were slaves, and as long as the Gentiles were slaves to the law which is written on our hearts, as long as that was the case, God was at a very great distance. We could not go near him because we are sinners and he is holy and perfect. There was a great divide and gap between God and us. But now, when we come under the promise and we accept Jesus as Savior, our status changes so radically that no longer is the you know, label slave pasted on us. Rather, the label that is there on us is sons and daughters of God. What kind of sons and daughters? Sons and daughters who can actually address God with that very intimate word, Abba. You know, because um, uh, that was the Aramaic word which was used by little kids. You know, before they can really, before they have really learned to talk, you know, they just say, Dada. You know, they say, Baba. You know, they don't, they don't really know the actual wording. They'll not say, Father. You know, they will not um, use all the terms which maybe more grown-up children would use. These are very baby terms. Great intimacy. I mean, uh, uh, let us say, you know, a man is now grown up and into adulthood. You know, in front of everyone, he's not going to walk up to his father and you know, say, Dada. It would sound a little you know, strange. But uh, when he's a little child, you know, it doesn't matter where he is in front, in, in, I know, in, in front of whom. He can just walk up to that uh, rich man and just say dada you know using the most informal intimate uh, wording and the father accepts it but the father is in no way offended by it so that is the kind of sonship to which you have been brought you know you who were once slaves of all these rituals and ceremonies and even after performing all of the ceremonies you could not really be sure that you have a relationship with god because the next day if you fall back into sin then you better come back with one more sacrifice and make one more animal sacrifice for that sin to be forgiven. So your position was so low, but now you can go to him and call him Abba. That is the status that you have that you're being given. So do not do not go back to the law. Understand the new status which you have been granted and enjoy that status. Okay, so in line with that, he continues his argument. And um, uh, so he's you know, expounding more on that, on the same thing. So if we can uh, look at verses 8 to 11. Someone, someone could read out for us verses 8 to 11. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Yeah. So he says... Once upon a time, you were depend. I mean, you were under the uh, power of these weak and beggarly elements. You know, the spiritual, uh, elemental forces which we talked about a little while ago. Uh, the ceremonies, the rituals, the sacrifices, the dress code, um, the cleansing that they had to perform in their homes. All of that, and all of these things which they had been placed under, those were actually very beggarly. In the sense, they could not make the people spiritually rich. They could not become sons of God by following those. So in spite of keeping all of those things, all, the, all those uh, you know, um, uh, disciplines and which had been given to them, they were still basically slaves of sin in spite of all of the keeping all of that. So those uh, law, 
the uh, the elemental uh, forces under which they had been placed those were very beggarly they could not make them rich also those ceremonial laws they were weak in the sense the law told them do this 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 but the law was not empowering them to keep that the law could only give orders but the law could not empower them to follow the laws so it was also weak so they were slaves of that and uh, they were observing special days and months and seasons and all of that so he says why are you going back to all of that yes back then it was very important that you had to you know observe a certain festival you had to go and ma make sacrifices at a or at a particular point of time if you didn't do that i mean it would affect you spiritually it would affect you materially but now you're free from all of that you don't need to follow those uh, rules and ceremonies now on the festival day you don't need to go and take a lamb and go and sacrifice and hope that something will come out of that no christ sacrifice is now there available to you so you don't have to go back to observing all of those things if you do that then it's as if i have wasted all my effort i have done so much to bring you to this position in christ to this high status where you can literally call him abba and now if you go back to the law and you lose that status it's as if all my efforts have been wasted so he says in verse 11 i fear for you that somehow i have wasted my efforts on you and so now he pleads with them and it's very nice though, you know, the things that he says in the uh, following verses. If we could have someone read out for us. Um, oh, there's a lot to be read. Um, maybe if you could read out verses 12 and, okay, fine. You know, it's a good reading exercise for whoever will volunteer to read. Uh, if you could read uh, from, uh, you know, verses 12 to 20, I, you know, kind of, you know, catch the tone that he's using. You know, he's speaking with such love, he's speaking with such concern. It's like the words are coming literally from the depth of his heart. Up to now, he, you know, he was giving explanations, he was teaching. And now the words that are coming out of his mouth are so personal. So just pay attention uh, to what he's saying. He's literally pouring out his heart over here in these verses. So from uh, if you could, uh, someone could read out for us uh, from 12 up to 20, please. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously quote you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always. And not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Yeah, so he says, I mean, look at the relationship that we had once upon a time. At that time, when I came over, came to you uh, with my eye uh, infection or whatever it is that he had, that ailment which he had, um, they were... They loved him so much that, you know, if, if possible, they would have plucked out their eyes and given it uh, to him. So that is the kind of uh, relationship that they had. So now when he is saying, when he's scolding them for going back to the law, you know, he's saying, don't get offended by my words uh, because uh, uh, we have had a very, uh, you know, deep and personal friendship and relationship. So out of that relationship i am now speaking to you and he says in verse 19 no i am again in the pains of childbirth until christ is formed in you you know he's basically saying the first time i came to you i was uh, so 
keen that you should come into the family of Christ. So I preached my heart out. I tried to explain the gospel to you as clearly as I knew how. I would spend time in prayer in the night. I mean, of course, all this are not written over here. I'm bringing out the, the meaning of that term, you know, the pains of childbirth. This is how he gave birth to them, brought them into the family of God. He preached to them. He would have sat with them and explained to them, cleared their doubts. Those who are hesitating and wondering how they're going to face opposition from their, their relatives, he would have gone to them, you know, uh, spent time with them, uh, you know, uh, talked to them about the benefits that they can have if they, if they can just come to Christ. So he was there as their encourager, supporter, uh, explaining things. And then in the night, probably, you know, after at the end of a, of a tiring day, he would get down on his knees and cry out to God and intercede for them and say, Lord, please, I have spoken to these people today, but Lord, they will not come to you unless you intervene. Others, you know, Satan will take them away. So he would labor for them in prayer. He would weep over them. That is how he gave birth to them. It didn't just happen, you know, where he just went and stood at the, at the pulpit uh, and, you know, spoke something into a mic and then... Uh, that is not how this church was birthed. You know, he was he had come there at a time of weakness. He was suffering from an ailment and something to do with the eyes. I mean, you know, you basically need your eyes for everything. And so in that condition where he could not use his eyes properly and probably was in much pain, in that condition, he labored for them so that Christ would be birthed in them. And now after having done that, and brought them into the fold. Now they are going away. So he says, again, I'm going through the pains of childbirth once more because I'm seeing that rather than um, following Christ, you're being led away. And so now again, I'm in agony and again, I'm you know uh, on my knees interceding for you, uh, uh, trying to explain things to you because I need to see Christ formed in you. What I worked towards, all that should not be lost. All that effort must not be wasted. And uh, so he is desperately pleading with them. Uh, and uh, so, you know, those of us who are in ministry, this is a very high calling. You know, the, uh, the example that Paul presents here about how you do uh, teaching, how you do discipleship, a very high example that he has set. So in ministry, we need to have that kind of a burden for the people that we are ministering to. I mean, do we weep for them in prayer? No, do we, uh, or do we just simply share the gospel and walk away? You know, or do we sit with them, explain to them when we see them hesitating? Uh, are we there to go and encourage them so that uh, you know Satan does not pull them back into the world, but rather they would be brought into the fold? So it would involve many, many things. So it's literally like giving birth to a child. There's a lot involved in bringing forth the child. Uh, in this case, bringing forth the child into the kingdom. So um, he invested in that manner uh, you know, in the lives of the Galatians, and we would be expected to do the same. So whether we are in full-time ministry or whether you know we are just uh, in, in some secular role, but because we belong to Christ, you know, we also have the you know job of sharing the gospel with people. And uh, so are we investing in their lives in the way Paul invested in the lives of these people? Now, we cannot do that for everyone, but there are some people that God brings to each one of us. I've, I've seen that, you know, um, me having a more introverted personality. I'm not a person who goes out uh, to everyone and talks to them and you know uh, uh, but i've noticed that even in my small sphere of influence there are people that god brings you know that god lays on my heart where i feel that i should go and talk to them and start investing in them so they have now become my responsibility so if Christ is to be formed in them, if they are meant to grow more and more in him, if they're meant to draw closer to me here, to him, it's my responsibility. God holds me responsible for it. So none of us can say, oh, oh I'm not in full-time ministry, so you know I don't really need to you know, invest in people the way they Paul did. None of us can use that excuse. Each of us, wherever we are placed, 
there are because we have now become believers and now we are his witnesses he brings people to us so that we can witness to them so once we feel that calling you know the, the lord is asking us to go and invest in someone's life and uh, cause help christ to be formed in them it becomes our responsibility so we have to take that seriously so what is happening to those children that we have birthed that is something that we would have to uh, you know pay attention to we can't just say oh, okay the person got saved i'm so glad and walk away we have a responsibility towards them even after they have come into the faith you know are they growing is christ being formed in them what is our obligation towards them are we still continuing to pray for them uh, so um, even after they have come into the family of god we continue to have a responsibility towards them okay so uh, we we see that coming out in these uh, verses now coming to the last portion of this chapter where um, paul uses the um, example of sarah and hagar to make a very important point there are many things that he has said up to now regarding the law and he has tried to you know um, impress upon the readers hearts that going to the law is really a disadvantage it's not going to benefit them in any way in fact it's going to work against their interests it's better for them to stay under the promise being made through christ rather than going to the law now he makes one ultimate argument okay so that is uh, what you have all the way from from verse 21 up to verse 31 uh, let's take it in you know in uh, small portions uh, so if uh, maybe we could have someone read out for us uh, 21 to 26 yeah someone could read out for us chapter 4 21 to 26 tell me you who desire to be under the law do you not hear the law for it is written that abraham had two sons the one by a bond woman the other by a free woman but he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh and he of the free woman through promise which things are symbolic for these are the two covenants the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, uh, yeah. O Baron. Okay, 26 is done. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we'll now have to get into a little background about Sarah and Hagar uh, to catch what is being said over here. Uh, so, you know, if you were to go to Genesis chapter 21, um, okay, if you were to go to Genesis chapter 16, because that's basically where, um, um, you know, uh, Hagar runs away from Sarah. Um, uh, Sarah is treating her very badly uh, because she's, uh, you know, uh, jealous now that Hagar is pregnant uh, and uh, so Hagar runs away and God says no go back go back uh, you know and stay under Sarah submit to her so Hagar returns uh, so somehow the two ladies have you know managed to stay under the same roof you know after this event for almost uh, 17 years now okay so Ishmael has been born uh, the the boy has been growing up so he's now around 16 or 17 years of age. Um, and now in the meantime, um, Isaac has been born. And Isaac is just a little boy of about two or three years of age. So when we come to Genesis chapter 21, um, um, Ishmael is now around 16 or 17. And this uh, little boy, Isaac, is around two or three years. And that is the time when they would wean the child. Up to now, the child had just been, uh, you know, uh, living on mother's milk. But now in future, now onwards, the child is going to start having solid food. So there would be a ceremony to celebrate this, uh, this you know, this new chapter in the, in the baby's life. So uh, they're having this grand celebration. And at that time, uh, 
uh, Sarah notices Ishmael making fun of this little boy. Okay, so and that upsets her a lot. It makes her very angry. And uh, so if in Genesis chapter 21, verse 10, this is what she says to Abraham. She says, cast out this slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, with Isaac, uh, is, is what she says. So in her mind, she's kind of thinking about all the practical details, actually, which are involved, you know, in... Uh, she started off this whole problem in the first place. I mean, she's the one who said, you know, why don't you marry my slave, Hagar? And then uh, the child who comes through that, you know, um, we'll, we'll have an heir. So she, in fact, started off the whole process. Um, but now, after she got her own biological child, she started thinking. Now, Ishmael has been legally, you know, brought up as Abraham's son. So he is going to have a part of the inheritance. And uh, he is much older than Isaac. And now, uh, uh, when the ceremony is going on, when the weaning ceremony is going on, he's making fun of the baby. So she's kind of worried in her mind, probably. She's thinking, you know, OK, this guy is much older. What is he going to do to my son? Will my What will be the rights and privileges of my son? Because this guy is going to overshadow everything. He's, after all, the older one. You know, and legally he's the older one. He has legal rights to the property, to the inheritance. So she's kind of thinking of all of that. And on top of that, she now sees him making fun of the child. So which means he's not friendly towards the child. He has a low opinion of the child. Seeing all of this, she's very upset. And she says, cast out this slave woman. She's not just simply saying, send her away. When she's using the term cast out, you know, it's being used in the sense of Leviticus 21.7. It's talking about divorce. Formally divorce this lady so that in future, Ishmael will not have any legal right anymore to the inheritance. Because so so she makes it very, very plain. She says, the uh, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, with Isaac. No sharing of inheritance. No, it all has to come to Isaac alone. So therefore, legally send away this lady and her son. Legally, I know, anal, terminate the um, contract so that uh, I, uh, Ishmael tomorrow will not have any kind of legal claim. It's, so it's basically what she says. And Abraham, you know, if you remember, was very upset with this because he loved both the sons, you know, because after all, both of them were his children. So he loved both of them. And he was not very pleased with the idea. But God backs up Sarah regarding this matter. And God says, yes, it must be this way. You must send away Ishmael. Why? Why did God back up Sarah you know, on this matter? Uh, because the life of Sarah and the life of Hagar would be carrying spiritual implications. God would be using them to bring out certain spiritual truths. And so um, this whole thing had to be done uh, in, in accordance with what God has in mind. You know, if you, if you were to uh, take the example, earlier example of Moses, you know, he is asked to speak to the rock the second time to bring out the water rather than strike it. And it would seem like a very insignificant thing. I mean, what does it matter whether you're speaking to the rock or striking it? But then there was a spiritual significance involved over there. That rock was supposed to represent Christ. And Christ needs to be struck only once for the living waters to be released. You don't need to you know, strike Christ uh, three, four times. He doesn't have to go to the cross three, four times. So there's, some, there's a spiritual uh, significance to a very natural action. In the same way over here, you're basically thinking maybe, oh, this is the life of two ladies, you know, Sarah's life and Hagar's life. But no, there are some spiritual truths interwoven into this story. And so therefore, it is very, very important and vital that Ishmael should be sent away. Because when God made the promise, you know, that promise uh, yeah, of Genesis 15, he was uh, Abraham was told that uh, one son would receive the covenant. He would receive the inheritance. And that son, of course, was um, Isaac, 
not Ishmael. So if Abraham were to divide his inheritance between both the sons, then that promise would not be fulfilled. That promise was made only for one covenant son, which is why uh, um, in Genesis 22, you know, um, God says to Abraham, your one and only son, because he's, he's the one and only covenant son that God is referring to over there. So uh, the inheritance cannot be shared with, with, between Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac alone would need to uh, have it. Why is God so particular about all of this? Um, in verse 23, this is what Paul says. Uh, his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. And then the other covenant, you know, is uh, represents the promise. Okay, so, um, so he talks about these things. The point that he is making is that Ishmael as the older boy, as the older son, actually had legal right to the inheritance. So in a way, he also had legal right to the covenant, you could say. On the other hand, this younger child who was born much later, about 17 years, 16 or 17 years later, he had no legal entitlement to the, uh, to the Abrahamic inheritance or in fact to the covenant. But God decided even before Ishmael existed, even before Isaac existed, God decided that it would come to Isaac. So the promise which God made, in the according to that promise, he said that by grace, by his mercy, he would grant the covenant to the younger child. So the legal right belongs to the older child, but by mercy and grace, even though Isaac does not deserve it, this covenant would be given to Isaac instead. This was the original promise that was made by God. Now, if you look at the Jewish, the Judaizers, what were they saying? They were saying, you have to earn the right to be children of God. So you have to keep the Mosaic law. You have to fulfill all the legal requirements. And then you will be entitled to be a child of God, is what the Judaizers are saying. But Paul explains to them, don't you remember the story of what was written in the law? I know in, in the first five books, in the Torah, it was very clearly written that even though the legal entitlement was with Ishmael, who actually received the covenant? It was not the one who had the legal entitlement. It was the one who had who was freely given it as a promise. It was freely given to an undeserved person. So Paul is saying to the Judaizers, you are thinking that you can earn your status of being a child of God by keeping the law. But no, look at those ancestors of yours, Ishmael and Isaac, the story which they, which their life tells. The inheritance, the covenant does not come to us through legal entitlement where we earn it. No, it is something that is just given freely as a promise. And if you will just believe that and accept it, it comes to you. It's not something that can be earned, you know, it's the point that um, Paul is trying to make over here. So he, he's, he's writing here in this letter to the Galatians and he says in verses 28, 29, 30, he says, uh, yeah, someone could read out that verses 28, 29, 30, please. We don't have much time. If you could, I know I just wanted to rest my voice a little bit. So, verses 28, 29, 30, please. Now, we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bond woman and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. 
so then brethren we are not children of the bond woman but of the free okay so uh, uh, paul says long ago the legal heir uh, you know this uh, ishmael he mocked persecuted that little boy isaac in the same way this judaizers who have legally who think that they have legally earned their status as children of god they are trying to persecute and mock you people who have just come to uh, god by faith on the basis of a promise which god made they have placed their faith in that promise and they have become children so the persecution which started at that time is continuing up to today in the same way the uh, the legal legally entitled person persecuted the one who was by grace even today you people who are by grace are being persecuted by these judaizers who think that they have legal right to the um, to the uh, to the to heaven just because they have kept the law but what does it say what does scripture say in, in verse 30 he says but what does scripture say get rid of the slave woman and her son for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son in the same way these judaizers who are now you know uh, persecuting you and who are saying look we have kept the law we have earned the right to be children of god he says get rid of them in the same way at that time uh, abraham had to get rid of hagar and her son you two today will have to get rid of these judaizers doesn't matter how influential they are how powerful they are you need to get rid of them because he says brothers and sisters we are not children of the slave woman but of the free woman and uh, so to to make the spiritual point it was necessary that god uh, you know ask abraham to send away hagar and ishmael however this does not mean that god disliked hagar or hated ishmael because we see that he, he he tells abraham that you know he will bless ishmael uh, with very great blessing that he will be the father of 12 princes you know so in the same way uh, 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 isaac later on you know becomes the uh, 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 an ancestor of the 12 tribes even ishmael was given 12 tribes you know in no way was ishmael treated in an, in an inferior manner but the point that uh god wanted to make was that this hagar who had been a slave and who brought forth the son yes she had the law on her side her son had legal status on his side but that did not lead anywhere because long before that god had made a promise to abraham under the stars saying that there's going to be a covenant son and whether he deserves it or not freely he will be given the inheritance so uh sarah was representing the heavenly jerusalem hagar was representing the earthly jerusalem and uh, the heavenly entry into the heavenly jerusalem is only through faith where you just simply accept the promise that god is giving that if you believe in me i will bring you to my kingdom entry so these judaizers can only have entry into the physical jerusalem not the heavenly jerusalem if they hold on to the uh, you know to the law so uh, he uses this point uh, to explain to even the judaizers that they are making a mistake their only hope is not uh, you know in holding on to what ishmael represents but it will be better for them to come and place themselves under what uh, isaac represents so to come under the promise rather than stay under the law okay so uh, these are the points which uh, paul brings out to show the people that they don't need to be followers of the law so let's just quickly close with a word of prayer god we just thank you for the many lessons that we could uh, learn from these two chapters and yes lord uh, today we know so clearly that we cannot win your favor or earn your favor by trying to keep uh, laws by uh, trying to impress you uh, through our good deeds and works lord your holy spirit and miracles 
are granted to us simply by believing in the finished work of the cross. Thank you, O oh Lord, for that. So we pray that you would help us to continue building ourselves up in the faith by meditating on your scriptures, by uh, causing those scriptures to literally become imprinted on our hearts so that we will believe in you more and more and be able to uh, step into all that you have for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. We'll meet again next class. Thank you, Pastor.